1924, a man named Albert Osman made history. In a field where most stories are obscured, questioned relentlessly, misinterpreted, and, more often than not, lost to the shadows of time, let's take a moment to hope that Albert Osman's story remains an extraordinary beacon of light in the history of cryptid encounters. Much like most stories of this genre, everything started quite naively, and with zero intentions of turning into the fantastic adventure it would eventually become. There was nothing about Albert Osman and his life so far that would have suggested he'd be the chosen one to live the truly incredible journey he experienced. Albert had worked for most of his adult life in logging and construction work. He was a strong, brave and independent man of reliable and ready body and mind. He also happened to have an interest in gold mines, working as a prospector, which would be one of the things that inadvertently led him to the shocking events that not only completely changed his life, but that could have easily meant the end of it all for him. In 1924, Albert Osman had just recently finished a job at a construction site. He decided to opt for a vacation that could double as a chance to work as a prospector. He would go searching for a gold mine that was supposedly located at the head of Toba Inlet. This was one of the inlets of the British Columbia coast, and, to get there, Albert Osman needed to take a boat and then hire an old Native American to guide him to the head of the inlet. That was the beginning of a highly dangerous and transformative trip for Albert Osman, who didn't suspect a thing. Although, in that journey accompanied by his guide, Albert Osman received the first bad omen, red flag, or vital piece of information that could have saved his life later on. It was a long journey, so Albert Osman gladly struck up a conversation with his guide. Besides, he was genuinely interested to know stories about other men that had attempted to reach the same goal as he had. So, the Indian guide told Albert plenty of stories about tales about the land. But one case in particular caught Albert's attention. It was the story of a white man that repeatedly brought gold from the mine just to go blindly wasted in saloons on too many drinks. It was said that this man was nothing but trouble, so no one felt particularly upset when he suddenly disappeared. Still, his disappearance was a great mystery, and people scrambled to find an answer. Most people might have chosen to believe that, drunk as he usually was, the man must have accidentally stepped on the wrong spot while climbing and ended up falling in some inhospitable crack in the ground and inevitably died there all cold and alone. However, that wasn't even the scariest and most worrisome possibility. In fact, many people instead believed something much more sinister happened to this man. They said he was brutally murdered by the Sasquatch. This legend surely would have sparked many questions from anyone that heard it. Why did they believe that? Was there some proof? Had they found the body or pieces or traces of him anywhere? Has it happened before? How could it be avoided? Should they immediately turn around and leave that place as fast as humanly possible? But, as it happened, at that point in his life, but not for much longer, Albert Osman had never heard about the Sasquatch before. Naturally, Albert inquired about it, about this animal he didn't know about and the old Native American was suspiciously reluctant to talk about the subject in great detail. But still, he told everything he knew to Albert, possibly to warn him against a similar fate to the man that came before him. According to his guide, they have hair all over their bodies, but they are not animals. They are people, big people living in the mountains. My uncle saw the tracks of one that were two feet long, one old Native American saw one over eight feet tall. Inevitably, Albert felt a chill run down his body at the horrible description and everything it meant. Not animals, people, giant people living in the wilderness, 
and are very capable of killing innocent passers-by. But not. It couldn't be. Albert refused to believe it, even if it was just for the sake of his sanity. He told his guy that he couldn't believe in fables like that. Though, to be respectful, Albert added that maybe they were real thousands of years ago, but they certainly couldn't exist any more. The guide's next words only made Albert even more scared. He said, there may not be many, but they still exist. With that seed of doubt planted in his mind, Albert had no option but to try to distract himself, focus on the journey, and forget about creepy and impossible myths. Finally, the pair reached the head of the inlet. They agreed that the guide would return to that same spot three weeks later. After exploring during that time, Albert would return to that spot and camp there until the old Native American returned to pick him up and lead him back home. It was a simple and common plan, and it should have gone through without any complications. By the time he was completely alone, Albert Osman wasn't scared at all. He was excited, he felt ambitious, and he was confident in his good luck that it would take him to the desired gold mine safely. He had no idea how quickly his fate would be turned upside down. The very first couple of days turned out to go exactly as expected. Albert started moving around the land, exploring, getting acquainted with his surroundings, and moving deeper into the wilderness. He was completely alone, or so he thought. He was aware of the beautiful scenery, the wild animals, and certain magic in the air around him. He felt no foreboding feeling yet. To travel and survive by himself, Albert Osman was well equipped with almost everything he might possibly need to make it through three weeks alone. He would need to find water and hunt when he could. But he had sugar, salt, bacon, beans, prunes, macaroni, cheese, pancake flour, snuff tobacco, butter, milk, and several units of canned food. Additionally, to protect himself in case of emergencies, he had a sheath knife, a rifle with two boxes of shells, and a homemade prospecting pick, which served as an axe and a pick. Surely that was more than enough to survive safely and comfortably as he had so many other times before in so many other places like that one. He had no reason to fear this trip would be catastrophically different from the others. After two more days of exploration, long walks, climbing, temporary campsites, digging for water, and eventually hunting a small deer, Albert reached a new chapter in his adventure. He had arrived at an ideal spot for a more lasting campsite. The spot was surrounded by cypress trees, a rock wall, and a little stream of water close by. Albert set up his camp, all his bags, his food, and his tools. He set up a fireplace for cooking, and he felt perfectly content and accomplished with his trip so far. Naturally, that was exactly when everything changed. Unfortunately for Albert, he was a very heavy sleeper. If this had been different, if perhaps he had woken up on time that first time, and seen the signs. If he had caught at least one sight of his visitor, maybe he would have escaped in time. But then again, we wouldn't have this astounding recollection of events that followed. Because Albert was a heavy sleeper, he didn't notice anything had happened during that first night. It was only after he woke up that he realized his camp had been disturbed. It was nothing too bad, nothing too aggressive. And, in fact, nothing was missing at all. The next night, Albert prepared a little better. He loaded his rifle and left it against his sleeping bag. He also put his shoes inside the bag, choosing to be prepared for anything. However, once again, he slept through the mysterious midnight visit. This time, things were different. 
his campsite was much more disturbed. Everything was a mess. His bag had been turned upside down and all its contents were strewn all over the ground. It was a baffling thing. Still, the only things he could tell were missing were the prunes and the flower. This behaviour confused him. He hoped the invader was some small animal he could hunt for a good meal. But he couldn't be sure what exactly it was. He tried climbing to a higher spot to spy on his own camp and try to catch the intruder. But nothing, and nobody showed up. This was just starting to affect Albert's nerves and patience. On the fateful night when everything was about to change, Albert took several precautions. He memorised the exact place where he left his belongings. He kept all his clothes on and his boots at the bottom of his sleeping bag. He placed his rifle inside his bag with him and his prospecting pick against a tree within an arm's reach. He was fully prepared to face any kind of wild animal. He only failed to consider he was about to meet something that wasn't completely animal or human. Something that nobody could prepare him for. Besides, Albert made one grave mistake. Once again, he fell deeply asleep. When he woke up again, someone or something was moving his body. He was barely conscious, more asleep than awake, and the only thing that registered in his mind was the strange feeling of being picked up. It was so unlikely, so sudden, that his brain could hardly process it. But it was true. When he finally landed somewhere, his entire body woke up at once. He was disoriented, utterly confused, and the darkness surrounding him didn't help at all. However, it wasn't so difficult to guess that he was being carried away from his camp. Now that he was awake, Albert's senses were attacked from all angles. The smell around him was pretty unpleasant, like deep inside a stable, but just wilder and stranger. His boots at the bottom of his sleeping bag were painfully digging against his feet and calves. He tried to reach for his knife or grasp his rifle, but his body was awkwardly contorted. His arms were pinned to his sides, and he felt helpless and unable to move. Everything started to ache. Albert wanted to believe he was on top of a horse, captured and kidnapped by someone, but his sense of logic and the obvious facts around him were at odds. The horse was a reasonable explanation, but this didn't feel at all like the rhythm of a horse. Whatever was carrying him was walking at a steady, very human pace. And eventually, Albert distinctly heard someone cough. That was it. This was no horse or any regular animal. Against his hopes, against logic, against everything he thought was natural, Albert had to admit that the only explanation left was that he was on the shoulder of one of those mountain Sasquatch giants he had just found out about from his guide on the way there. The realisation was shocking and chilling, and Albert desperately looked for a way out, but he was completely lost. In fact, if it weren't for a small opening in his sleeping bag, he might have even lost consciousness or even asphyxiated before finding out where they were going. It was deeply uncomfortable. He could feel his bag and the cans inside digging against his back, and the creature's body shifting underneath him, carrying him as if he didn't weigh a thing. They walked for a long time, uphill, downhill, through uneven paths and some softer stretches of land. Albert was more and more worried with each passing second. He had no way to keep track of their path. He was beyond lost and incredibly scared of not being able to make his way back to his camp, and that's in case he was even lucky enough to escape from his captor. Finally, it looked like they reached their destination. The Sasquatch unceremoniously dropped him on the ground, and Albert was unable to restrain the groan of utter pain. He remained still for a moment, trying to catch his breath and reacquaint himself with his sore body. 
This meant he was unable to overhear a conversation going on around him. Or, at least, he thought it was a conversation. At first, he thought the people around him were murmuring. But then it hit him. This was an unknown language. There was more than one Sasquatch with him, and they were talking in their language of groans and grunts. Albert couldn't even guess a single word of it. As soon as he could, Albert scrambled out of his sleeping bag and as far away from the creatures as he could. He tried and failed to stand up because his legs were asleep. He grabbed his rifle and prepared for the worst. But nothing immediately attacked him, so he worked on getting his shoes on and rubbing some senses into his aching limbs. In these tense minutes, Albert was able to notice a lot of things. The sun was starting to rise, illuminating a sort of small, charming, hidden valley he was in. And also, his haunting company. There were exactly four of those giant creatures, and in Albert's mind, they looked like a family. An old man and a woman, along with a young boy and girl. The Native American was right. They weren't animals, but they couldn't have been regular humans. The old man must have been about eight feet tall, or the younger ones were around seven feet tall. They were completely covered in hair, except for the palms of their hands, soles of their feet, and a small patch of skin on their faces. The hair was thick and short, except for the top of the head where it grew a few inches long. Their bodies were so similar to humans, but bigger in every possible way. Big muscles, hands, torsos, legs, all of them. They were stronger and very agile, capable of walking barefoot on unforgiving surfaces just as well as climbing steep rock walls. But their language remained the most baffling of things. So, when Albert saw himself completely surrounded by these wild giants, he yelled at them, What do you fellows want with me? Then, obviously, he didn't receive an answer he could understand. Instead, he witnessed some sort of argument between them, the woman and younger specimens didn't seem to like him, and the old man was quite insistent. After a while, they turned away from Albert, but this didn't mean he was free. Albert prepared himself and took another look at his surroundings. He was in a valley of about eight or ten acres, but it was surrounded by mountains that would be quite difficult for him to cross. There was an opening on one end of the valley, and that was where the old man took a seat. Everything about it was a clear message that was there to keep Albert from leaving through his only exit. This could only mean one thing, and Albert had to accept it. He was captured, kidnapped, and now he was captive. The first thing Albert did was scramble away from his captors. He took his belongings with him to the west wall of the valley and he reviewed everything that he had left. It wasn't much, but he could definitely survive a few days. He also went over his possibilities. There was no chance he could physically fight these beings and win. He could use the rifle. It would be unfortunate to kill them. They looked so human to him that he even entertained for one moment the idea of taking them back to civilization. In Albert's mind, they were closer to humans than animals. He didn't want to be a murderer. He figured he would need to use a different strategy to escape. And yet, despite his mercy, on the day he packed up his things and tried to just walk through the opening at the end of the valley, the old man stood up, held up a hand, and made a strange noise in his language that left no room for protest. The message was clear. Albert was trapped. That was the beginning of the strangest, scariest, and most surreal days of Albert Osman's life. His days passed slowly, always observed by strangers, always with his guard up, always looking for a way out. Before I finish this story, I just want to say thank you for choosing to watch this video and I hope you're enjoying my storytelling. 
If you are, please hit that like button and if you don't already, subscribe to my channel. Also, those of you that have been kind enough to support me on my new Patreon account were able to get early access to the uncut audio of this story and free prior to my YouTube upload. I have a starting tier of just $3 per month and have just launched a new $9 per month tier if you want to support my mission to become a full-time storyteller and content creator, please head over to Patreon and consider signing up. In the beginning, Albert and his captors kept their distance from each other. He ate his food cold and barely slept, and the others watched over him curiously, sometimes interested, sometimes with distaste, and sometimes looking as scared as he did. On the first day, Albert had the first hint of what would become his salvation. The young boy in the group of Sasquatches was the boldest and most curious one. He approached Albert slowly, but Albert, being in a foul mood at this shocking twist of his trip, acted on impulse and threw one empty box of snuff at the boy. The young specimen avoided it, but then entertained himself and his sister for a long while playing with the box. Even the old man seemed interested in it. This would be key to Albert's escape. In the following days, the hairy giants became more and more interested in Albert. While Albert, begrudgingly, became more comfortable in that space. The boy came closer and closer to him every day. Albert teased them with little bits of snuff tobacco that the old man was particularly fond of and the family even shared with Albert some of the sweet roots and grass that they got from somewhere in the mountain that, unlike Albert, they could easily climb. In the meantime, Albert found a small stream of water and even started a small fire to heat his food and make coffee. He spent most of his days trying to figure out a peaceful way out, dying to find a way to communicate with them and hoping against hope and even if he made it out of that valley, he would be able to find his way back. Six whole days passed in this torturous routine. Finally, something had to give. Albert's patience ran out. The Sasquatch's curiosity reached a dangerous peak, and the combination was dangerous. On the fateful day, ironically, it was the old man who took the first step that would lead to Albert's freedom. He had grown more and more interested in the tobacco, and Albert was sure that he could use this in his favour and make a fair trade in exchange for his freedom. However, even he was shocked by the turn of events. When the old man was close enough, Albert took a pinch of snuff for himself, hoping the Sasquatch would do the same. However, curious and ignorant of the details of what he was doing, the giant yanked the whole box from Albert's hands, and he emptied all its contents in his mouth, greedily eating every little bit of it as he could. The effect was nearly instantaneous. His eyes began to water and roll to the back of his head. He was about to be sick, and he had no idea what to do about it. The only thing he thought to do at the time was to imitate Albert once more, so he grabbed Albert's cup of cold, bitter coffee and also drank every drop of it. It only made things worse. The old man started squealing and crying out in utter pain, and everyone turned tense and nervous. Albert reached for his rifle, but the giant didn't attack him, and instead ran away toward the spring for water. The young boy went after him, and this was the sign that Albert had been waiting for. It was his chance to escape. He hastily grabbed all his belongings and started running toward the natural exit of the valley. Albert was surprised to see that the old woman was following him. She looked scared and angry, and she was making loud, frantic noises as well. She probably thought Albert had hurt her family, but there was no time or way to explain himself. Albert had to take his only chance. He aimed his rifle at the rock wall, at a spot above the head of the woman, and he fired. He didn't mean to hurt her, but it must have given her a big scare. It earned Albert enough time to run away from there as fast as he could. He started running downhill, 
careful but in a hurry. He travelled for miles and miles, always looking over his shoulder, always expecting the worst, until, slowly but surely, he had to admit he'd finally made it. He had escaped. There was nothing and no one chasing him anymore. Since that moment, his only concern became to find his way home, to never return anywhere close to that dreadful place, and to try and live his life despite this haunting, extraordinary, and life-changing event. This story was written by Danny Rachel Nieto and narrated by me, James Devrell. Don't forget to check out the content I am releasing on other platforms such as Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. If you or anyone else you know has a story about anything related to high strangeness, please reach out to me with a brief description to stories at daredevil.com. I don't need you to write the whole story, so you don't need to worry about being an English major. We'll be doing all the writing. You'll just need to be willing to jump on a call with me so we can have a chat and I can get the whole story. Thanks again for watching.